so you probably read we did get a favorable ruling from the Supreme Court. Uh, thank President Trump for his good justices he's appointed. And that was a five to four vote. And that's the importance of elections and why they matter. Um, and, and so New York, uh, Governor Cuomo has been handed a defeat in his restrictions against churches. And I've been in contact with Pacific Justice Institute and uh, their attorneys have filed suit, uh, the same suit in California with the Supreme Court against uh, Governor Newsom. So we'll stand by on that one for the ruling. There was also a suit filed in Santa Clara County as well. Santa Clara County is really, really restrictive, as you know. And uh, some churches there have racked up some big fines. So uh, we'll stay tuned. And if you just want to follow this, uh, Pacific Justice Institute PJI is a good resource on this. So I thank Mr. Snyder for his good work and told him we would do whatever we needed to do uh, you know, to uh, you know, promote the fair and equal treatment under the First Amendment for churches. And I think that's all we're asking for. We're not asking for special treatment or preferential treatment. What we're simply asking for is equal treatment under the law. Uh, yes, Jerry. Well, I have not followed it real closely, but on, on what grounds do the, other, do the other four justices agree or, or disagree with them? I mean, so, it's a constitutional issue, like at least that's what they're thought. <laughs> they're activist judges. So, so how many of you have read the ruling? I read the ruling. You can read the ruling. It's very interesting. And uh, there are the dissents on there. Uh, Gorsuch is... Uh, support is really interesting. He's kind of funny, actually, where he likens things to bicycle stores and hardware stores and things like this. And I read uh, Kagan and uh, Sotomayor and um, uh, Breyer. Breyer's a third liberal, isn't he? Who's, who's the third one? I'm, I'm phasing out. Here. I'm, yeah. Anyway, you can read the ruling. So the, the rationale is um, the rationale all centers around the First Amendment and whether that can be infringed in a time of emergency. And so Governor Newsom, under the Emergency Services Act, has been given certain powers. I'm speaking of Governor Newsom now, not Governor Cuomo, because I don't know the laws in the state of New York. Does anybody know the laws there better? I do not know them. So I really can't comment intelligently on them. Uh, the ruling, if you read it, is interesting because uh, Kagan and Sotomayor essentially rationalized using statistics that it's an imminent danger and that governors, when there's imminent danger, can actually um, suspend constitutional rights and uh, infringe on them for the sake of the common good. So that's kind of the rationale that goes uh, you know, with that. Um, you know, so you can read the ruling if you'd like. It's, it's actually good reading, you know, pull it up and you can read the ruling. Um, and so we'll wait and see what happens with uh, the California situation. The, the thing is, this is injunctive relief. And injunctive relief is simply this, it's an injunction. All it means is everything's put on hold. Everything's on hold in New York. It's gonna go to an appeal court. So the same thing, and I asked, uh, uh, Attorney Snyder, if we as Californians could get injunctive relief, and that's what they're filing for right now. If we can get an injunction that says, time out, let's put this on hold, let's get this to an appeal court, and allow the churches to function in the same manner as anyone else. Um, how many of you have gone shopping recently? How many of you have gone shopping the last eight months, have gone to stores? Okay. Okay, so many people have gone to stores. Some people are avoiding stores completely. Um, and, and this is one of the, th the issues that has come up too. You know, is it safer to go to a store than it is to go to church? That's one of the questions that has to be raised. And so when they're looking at this, you know, they, 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 they look at this and they, they assess it. So it's a constant assessment, it's changing, um, and, and we'll see what happens uh, with it. Um, so all we can do is wait and see. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, interesting medical question. Have any of you followed trials that they've done on vaccines? You follow that much? Pfizer, Moderna, different uh, companies. I had a question about that. And, and, and all, everybody that participates in a trial is a volunteer. You can't pay anybody to do that. And you have to take a cross section. You have to take alcoholics, you have to take smokers, you take people, you know, obese people, you take fit people, you want a good cross-section. Well, what's the one big change in a trial right now that would be occurring with the participants? What's the one big change that kind of comes out and hits you between the eyes? Isolation. 
Isolation, that, that could be one of them. That's up there, but even bigger than that, and I don't have one right now. Where is it? How many of the participants will be wearing masks in the trial? The, the answer is a lot of them will, right? Because they tell you to go and live your life and do what you normally do. And normally people are wearing masks nowadays. Is that not going to skew the results? Do you think it would? Anyway, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not answering these questions because I don't know the answers. I'm not, and that's not my field, okay? But I raised this question to a physician, and the physician said, well, if masks are working the way we think they would work, they will skew the results. Because if you wear a mask and you're in the trial, you're probably not going to contract the virus. And there's two things that happen in trials. They're looking for two things. Number one, they're looking for symptoms. Do you develop symptoms of the disease? Symptoms isn't necessarily the disease. Symptoms are different. Or you actually get you know, the virus itself and it implants itself. So anyway, here's what I found out. I didn't know about this. They're called, uh, they're called variables, of, uh, the variables of research. Somebody help me out this in trials. You look this up. They have so many variables when they do trials. So there's a lot of smokers in this trial, right? You know, chain smokers, right? Well, what do you think they're going to be susceptible to? So they'll look at that, right? They're going to be alcoholics in the trial, okay? Uh, they're, gonna, they're basically going to look at the variables, and, and a lot of people that wear the mask, they're going to uh, exclude them from the study because it's going to throw the results. It's going to skew it. Because if masks are that effective, they're going to skew the results. Now, you can wear a mask like Daryl and still get a cold, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Girl took out a cold, you know, he wore a mask. So I don't know what the results of all that will be. Um, the other thing about vaccines, too, is I've had a lot of people tell me lately, well, I think things are going to get better when we get a vaccine, and, and, you know, we're just waiting for that vaccine, and then things will be safe. And I've told them, no, it's not. It's not going to be safe, um, you know, in that sense. And, and um, as far as church goes, I have people tell me they're not coming back until it's safe. And so my answer to that is, you're not coming back because it's never going to be safe to come to church. And I think that whole idea of safety and protection is something that's enveloping us so much now. And I tell people this, if you come to church, you're at risk. If you come to church or you go to do anything in life, you are at risk. If you get out of bed in the morning, you are at risk. Okay. And so I'm telling people, they're asking me, well, I'll come back when it's safe. And I tell them, you're not coming back to church then. Because it's never going to be safe. When will it be safe to come back to church? When we have a vaccine? No. When the virus is eradicated? No, because you're not going to eradicate a virus. Uh, when will it be safe to come back to church? Ask the people in paradise when it was safe to live in paradise. And is it still safe? You know. So all I'm saying, I'm not meaning to demean anything or belittle anything, uh, we have obsessed and made an idol out of safety. And it's almost like we're trying to avoid death. Does the Christian try to avoid death? No. The Christian says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Okay? So the Christian simply says, I'm not going to take undue risks, but if I happen to die, well, by the way, if you get a vaccine, is that going to solve death? <laughs> There's only one vaccine for death. That's Jesus and to be baptized. And I think that's important, too. Um, I'm trying to encourage people. I have one person that's really, really concerned about this. And I think if you look at facts... Uh, this virus has a 99% survival rate. I don't think we should forget that. 99% survival rate. That's really, really good. That's probably safer than driving your car or walking around the block, I think, but I don't know. Um, the, the other issue that comes up with a lot of this, too, is, is very interesting because there's a whole lot of political overtones to this whole thing, too, as you well know. Um, and, and discussion with people. I actually had a chance this week to witness to a lady who will not come to our church because our church is too conservative. And I guess she means I'm too conservative, then, I guess. You know, she said the church is too conservative. She said the Missouri Synod. So guess who the Missouri Synod is? Right here. <laughs> I'm the Missouri. No, seriously, that's, that's what it is, you know? And, and I know this lady, I've known her for years, okay? I've ministered to her uh, family, and, and uh, you know, uh, we get along famously. I actually love liberals. I like talking with them because they need Jesus. And conservatives need Jesus too, and moderates do too. We had a great talk, and she said she couldn't come to our church, and, and she's going to an Episcopal church because the ELCA is too liberal, and the Missouri said it's too conservative. <laughs> so she's going to an Episcopal church. And, um, 
we got talking about this, and, and I said, uh, actually, I don't like labels. I don't like to be called a conservative. I don't like to be called a progressive. Uh, the Lutheran Church is actually very liberal in some senses of the word liberal, if you look at it, define it properly, because we're not legalists. But I said, all we're doing in the Lutheran Church is teaching the Bible. We're teaching the Bible, the authority of God's word. And then I knew where this was going to go, because it was part of witnessing. I listened to her, and she says, well, the Bible has contradictions. And the Old Testament is very different from the New Testament. And I knew where this was going to go. Where do you expect this to go? She told me I'm a very liberal person. Now, what does a person mean by that? Translate that. I believe that homosexuality and lesbianism is acceptable. Okay? Yeah. And, and so then I said, uh, we, we teach that uh, certain behaviors are contrary to God's word, including adultery. And I said, I happen to be a heterosexual. But I believe adultery is wrong and it's sinful. And we had a wonderful conversation, and, and then we got into the idea of, well, the, the typical thing is, well, nobody would choose homosexuality. Nobody would choose those kind of things in life. Now, that's an interesting debate, because you can make a case, and I did, of original sin, that nobody chooses to be a sinner. Did you choose to be a sinner? And I did. I, I told this person that I was born a sinner. But I said, if you read Romans 1, it says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The people make these choices in life. I said, by the way, what about an alcoholic? Doesn't an alcoholic choose to drink? Okay. Or you take any crime. Okay. What about a criminal who robs banks? Doesn't, why would you choose to rob a bank? You know why? This is interesting. I think it's both. I think you're born this way and you choose this way. It's both in that sense. We have a wonderful conversation. So here's what I told her. Bottom line, if you have no sin, if you have no repentance, then you have no need of a savior. There's no gospel then. And I encouraged her to come to Redeemer. I said, we're going to preach and teach the law and gospel. But above all, we're going to bring you the Savior who came to save us from all sin. So we had a wonderful conversation. I pray for her. I'd ask you to pray for her. But these are the kind of conversations that take place. This is the world we're witnessing in when we go to being his witnesses right here in Chico, California, with people that we know, uh, friends, uh, neighbors. The other day, um, we, we had a little gathering in the neighborhood out front, and uh, I don't know what this is lately, but all the men are gathering. There were six or seven of us. You ever do this in your neighborhood? You sit out front, you know, lower the tailgate and talk to the men and everything. And the other day, so my neighbor Joe starts talking. I mean, the other guys are listening. His neighbor Joe starts talking about how life is and how you either follow absolutes, you follow the Bible, or you believe in evolution, survival of the fittest, basically. You know, where you just kind of do your thing and you just evolve and whoever comes out and top or you follow the Bible. And he's going on this. He's talking to me. And the other neighbors are like, they're, they're making these comments like, hey, uh, he's ministering to the minister. He's telling the preacher what he should believe. And they're like razzing him. And we're talking about all these subjects, which was very good. Uh, very good indeed. So there's always opportunities to talk. Um, uh, Jerry O'Lennon came by on Thanksgiving Day. I don't know if you saw that. He did a little news bite. You know, I had my 10 seconds of fame. I don't know if you caught that. Uh, it, it was a report on the Supreme Court ruling. And so he calls me at uh, uh, 11 o'clock on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, he says, I don't want to disturb you on Thanksgiving Day. I said, why not? There's nothing else to do on Thanksgiving Day, right? Did any of you do anything important on Thanksgiving Day? I said, all I'm doing is lounging around the house. Come on by, Jerry. You know, give you a little tri-tip or whatever. He came by and did a little sound bite on this thing and, you know, threw it out there um, because he just said, <laughs> Do you know this? This is true. Thanksgiving Day is the slowest news day of the year. There's nothing to report on. You know why? Everybody's home. There's no crime being committed because the stores are closed. You know? It's the slowest news day. And I said, gee, thanks a lot. You know? Bottom of the barrel. <laughs> yeah, bottom of the barrel. That's how it works. Anyway, it's all good. Any other announcements? Any comments? Okay. So we're going to continue on today on what is witnessing all about and look at God's word and then continue through the little study that we have. So let us bow our heads in prayer.